Hi, my name is Tom Sherlock. I'm uh, a user interface developer at Wolfram Research. Um, once again, I'm talking about uh, my hobby of astrophotography. I'm not a professional astrophysicist. I just like to go out and take pictures of uh, astronomical objects uh, with my telescope and uh, some equipment. And I thought I would um, share how I use Mathematica to uh, make this uh, process easier. So let's get started. To do astronomy, um, and uh, in particular astrophotography, uh, it involves uh, a fair amount of uh, data processing. Uh, and you can get commercial packages to do this, uh, but it's always more fun to roll your own. Um, and you have more control if you do it yourself. So that's why I use Mathematica. Um, but uh, there's a fair amount of work uh, involved. Uh, it's not just a matter of going outside and pointing your camera up at the sky. Uh, and I've talked about uh, aspects of this before. Um, so I'm going to continue about this. Um, so um, this is, uh, I took some pictures here in um, May of this year in, of um, uh, <clears throat> a, uh, a bright galaxy called M101, also known as the Pinwheel Galaxy. And I also managed to capture a supernova, which had just been discovered uh, the previous week. So let's uh, go down. So anyway, <clears throat> it's, uh, it is kind of tricky to do um, astronomical images of deep sky objects. And the reason why is because uh, all these objects are very dim. If you ever look through a telescope at something like uh, uh, the ring nebula, unless you've got a very, very large telescope, what you're looking at is kind of a fuzzy blob. And if it's a little larger telescope, you can start to see the ring structure, uh, but you almost never see any colors uh, unless you've got a really large uh, telescope, like a big Dobsonian scope. But you can capture this stuff with a smaller scope like I've got and uh, with um, an astronomical camera, but you have to do some work uh, to get uh, some results. And this isn't just work that amateurs have to do. Everyone has to do it. You know, even the scientists who run the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, they have a fair amount of, of um, <coughs> crunching that they have to do in order to get those nice pictures, uh, let alone actual meaningful scientific images. So <clears throat> you all, always have to, the big battle is uh, maximizing the signal and minimizing the noise. And uh, because the, the signal is so low and the noise is so high, it takes a fair amount of effort. So in order to do this, uh, you have to take multiple images, um, sometimes through a sequence of filters if you're trying to get a color picture. You have to take additional calibration images, which are images which capture the amount of noise that's in the image. And you have to um, subtract that noise out. And then uh, that sequence of images, you have to uh, combine in a statistical manner uh, to uh, maximize uh, the signal. And then additionally, you will probably have to do some image processing to sharpen and stretch and remove artifacts. But all that stuff can be done uh, in Mathematica using uh, fairly simple functions. So uh, for this talk, I've tried to recreate uh, as best I can uh, the pipeline uh, from a commercial package like uh, Pix Insight, which is a popular uh, astrophotography system. So let's go on to the next slide. So you can see that the workflow in order to get an image is fairly involved because it needs to be done on a sequence of images. And here I'm talking about monochrome images. Um, uh, if um, you want to produce a color image, you have to do this same workflow like three or four times through a different filter each time. And that uh, will give you each color channel. And then you combine those at the very end to create a, a final image. But right now, we're just going to keep it simple and talk about the monochrome workflow. And then you can just imagine that multiplied times four. So you start out with a set of what's called FITS uh, data files. FITS is a standard astronomical data format. Uh, it's used uh, by all uh, uh, astronomers. <clears throat> uh, last month I gave a talk about how you can download the FITS images coming from the, um, well, produced by the James Webb Space Telescope and create your own color images by combining the scientific data that they encapsulate. 
Uh, so we always start out with a sequence of these, which are sequ a sequence taken of the same object. And each one can be like 15 to one minute, 15 seconds to one minute long. And the reason why we don't uh, just take one long image is because it's hard to get a your telescope to uh, track accurately for a long amount of time, even with uh, automatic guiding. So once you've got your raw images, then you have to calibrate them, which is the process I mentioned before of subtracting out uh, the noise. So you have to take additional images uh, just to capture the noise. And um, this is actually something that's not too uh, unusual. A lot of um, uh, cameras, that just regular consumer grade cameras, if you take a long exposure, they'll take um, an additional calibration image and subtract it out kind of behind your back. Um, once you've got the images calibrated, then you uh, need to align them so they're on top of each other. And that's a little tricky because uh, sometimes they can drift. Uh, telescope alignment isn't perfect. And you have to uh, uh, find the right algorithm to line them up. Sometimes you have to do it by hand, as I talked about last month. Then you normalize them, you stack them, which is the statistical uh, averaging process. You perform uh, noise, additional noise reduction, and then you stretch them out to see the parts of the image that you're really interested in, which is the like the nebula or something. And you do final processing, you get the final image. So let's talk a little bit about this calibration process. Um, so calibration means uh, you're capturing additional images uh, which are um, taken with uh, the shutter closed or a cover over your telescope, and they measure noise characteristics of your camera. And there's uh, basically three types that we like to talk about. There's uh, <clears throat> what's called bias frames, and these are just um, estimate the uncertainty in reading a particular CCD chip cell. Um, and these are typically very short frames, uh, as short as you can get, maybe a, a five thousandths of a second, and the camera shutter is closed. So you're just, just estimating what's the uncertainty of reading a particular frame or a particular uh, cell out of the CCD. Then there's uh, dark frames, these estimate the thermal noise from the CCD chip. When you're taking a long exposure, <clears throat> the chip heats up and that produces a glow on the chip. And so you need to, to alleviate this, you typically refrigerate the chip and, um, and then uh, you um, uh, capture this and subtract it out. <clears throat> so, uh, so the dark frames need to be taken at the same temperature and exposure length as the image frames. So for this reason, it's important to have a regulated cooling system on the CCD camera. And this is my camera. And this whole back part of it is the cooling system. And then uh, you can also take flat frames, uh, which I'm not uh, describing in this particular uh, talk, but uh, this is the reason why you take flat frames. This is a picture of, um, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and you can see these big donuts here. These are uh, tiny bits of dust on the uh, on the filter uh, that's on the CCD chip, and it's uh, it produces a shadow in the shape of uh, the telescope aperture. So um, you typically take these uh, uh, at, after sundown. You get a uniformly illuminated surface, so you can see what the um, uh, garbages on your uh, in your optical system. So uh, the implementation here is all the code I'm going to use. So we're not going to go over that. I'm just going to describe it and then demonstrate it. So to get the uh, bias frames, um, <clears throat> you have to take a, a sequence of images, which is what I have already done here. And I'll include that with the notebook. And I have this uh, code here called compute master bias, which basically just averages out all the bias frames. So yeah, I've got 20 bias frames and I exported that into this master bias uh, fit file. Uh, same goes with uh, dark frames. So the dark frames, those are the file names. And here the dark frames also take the name of the master bias file because each dark frame has to have that bias noise subtract from it. 
So, um, yeah, so we had exported the master bias file. And we're going to skip over the flat frame uh, thing, but that would uh, I'll ex explain where that comes in later in the process. <clears throat> so, and okay. So um, <clears throat> then, you, after you, you have your uh, noise frames, the bias and and uh, dark frames uh, captured, um, you take what's called the light frames. So for each um, um, image subframe, you subtract out the bias frame. And you do this using image subtract. And uh, you uh, then subtract out the dark frame. And that subtracts out the bias noise and the dark noise. And then uh, the numbers. Um, in the FITS file um, are typically the actual um, <clears throat> uh, counts pulled out of the CCD uh, chips. And we like to work with the range 0 to 0, 0, to, 0, 0 0.0 to 1.0, which makes the processing easier. So uh, we have to do image adjust. So if you bring in one of these frames just as it is, it looks all white. It's because it's probably in the range, you know, 100 to 30,000. So uh, we have to do an image adjust, and that will automatically uh, normalize the image to this range. Once uh, the frames are calibrated, then they need to be precisely aligned. And this is a pretty tricky process. Uh, and I'll describe why. <clears throat> it could, uh, for some images, um, and good images, frankly, uh, there are too many stars. And in order to align the images, you need to um, pick uh, definite points to uh, compute an alignment transform. And if you have a bunch of stars which are about the same brightness, it's not going to work out very well because it's, it's hard to find the same set of stars. Um, the best type of algorithm uh, it creates basically artificial asterisms of three to five stars, and it computes a hash for each asterism by computing the relative positions of the stars in each asterism. And it uses that to compare um, an asterism from one image to the next. And those are uh, match up pretty well. But that's a, a comp complex algorithm. And last year, I demonstrated doing that by calling a Python routine, which executes that algorithm. Um, you can, uh, and you can also just uh, manually pick the stars yourself, which uh, works quite well uh, with highly detailed images. Last month, I gave a, a little lecture um, uh, to um, about the data science of doing this, and um, I did it with James Webb Space Telescope images, and I produced some nice color images. So this particular notebook um, does, uh, since my uh, images are fairly simple and they don't have too many stars, I can do the uh, basically the brightness uh, picking. Um, so. So the algorithm that I use, which works fairly well for these images, you have to find at least three bright stars in each image. And I do that with max detect. Then I determine the star centroids using component measurements. And then once I have uh, at least three um, uh, stars in each image, I <clears throat> and I do some, some other checking to make sure that they're pretty much the same stars. Um, I do, uh, I find geometric transform, uh, and that will compute uh, the rigid transform that takes one image into a subsequent image. And then um, I apply that to subsequent images using image perspective transformation. And that brings all the images into alignment with each other. And as I said, it works pretty good uh, as long as there aren't too many stars in the image. And it works approximately as well as the Python routines. You'll see uh, when I demonstrate this that there's um, some images that I can't find a transform for, but it still works pretty good. Um, uh, hopefully, if I have enough time, I'll try implementing the full asterism algorithm in Wolfram language in the future. 
And then uh, once you've got the images all aligned, uh, then you can stack them up. Now, before we can do this, uh, we have to basically uh, adjust the, um, <clears throat> the histograms of each image so they match each other. And the reason why is demonstrated by this example here. Uh, we're using a histogram transform. Um, and PixInsight does the same thing. Of course, they call it a little bit different. Uh, but we're using histogram transform. You can see these are two um, images like um, uh, an NMR image of, um, of someone's head. And if we didn't do, if we try averaging these two images, it would just make the bright parts here darker. And we need to have the images about the same brightness in all parts so that we're actually canceling out the noise and not canceling out the signal. So here, this transform this image so that it's approximately the same brightness values as this one. And then we can take a meaningful statistical average of these two. So uh, for this, we have to apply histogram transforms uh, to all of our aligned images with respect to a reference image, which I take to be the first image. And once that is done, then we can actually uh, average all the images to eliminate the noise. And uh, we use another function uh, in Mathematica called Windsorized Mean. And this is a robust uh, averaging process that is used for data that's in that has outline um, uh, data values. And this is useful for us because uh, a lot of times there's um, hot pixels or dead pixels in an image, and this eliminates them automatically. It will eliminate a certain percentage of these outline values at the tail ends of the um, of the histogram and replace them uh, with the next closest values. So this uh, is a good way to uh, uh, to average out the noise and get uh, the best possible signal. So uh, what we're doing here is I take all the aligned images, extract the image data from it, uh, flatten that out, and then uh, do a Windsorized mean on that whole uh, array. And that will give us uh, a combined data. And then I take that and I reconstruct the, uh, the average image by uh, partitioning it with the dimensions and constructing an image out of that. So the full pipeline is we do the aligning and stacking. And if we um, were using uh, flats, we would uh, use brightness equalize to, um, uh, to eliminate um, uh, dust artifacts uh, with our master flat image. And then uh, we'll use, um, we do a noise reduction pass, uh, and we like to use a total variation filter. Uh, and that, uh, it just doesn't blur out the image. It still preserves rapid transits in the image, but it doesn't uh, um, eliminate all um, of that data because some of it's valid. And then, um, I implemented the IRAF Z scale stretch algorithm, and that lets you pick out the interesting parts of the histogram, which is where the, like the dim um, nebula might be located. And then you can also um, average out the sky glow by sampling uh, points uh, randomly selected in the image and subtract that out and do a final image adjust. So that's a lot of talking. Uh, let's see if we can make this work here. Here's um, <clears throat> the Pinwheel Galaxy uh, M101 taken from uh, my backyard in Urbana. This is a professional photograph. Now, I, I didn't take this one. Um, so we can see what it looks like uh, based on our galaxy data. So here I've got my sub uh, file name, the file names of all the light frames. And as you can see, there's about 20 images I took, each one 30 seconds long. So I'm going to run, uh, I got all the stuff I talked about uh, built into this thing called image pipeline. So this is doing that whole process I just uh, talked about. 
So it's um, aligning the files. Here's our dark frame, our bias frame. Uh, this is our target frame. It's writing out these reference images, the reference image and then the transformed images. You can see in this one, it failed to find a transform, so it's skipping that one. So it's writing out these, these are the uh, aligned images. So here it's uh, bringing back in the aligned files and it's doing the histogram transform uh, pass. Yeah. Okay, so it's it's applied all the histogram transforms. It um, <clears throat> It's doing the Windsorized mean, it's uh, eliminating the 5% of the outline pixels. We could probably uh, tweak that and it's constructing the final image and it's removing the noise using total variation filter and doing the Z scale stretching. So this is uh, the image I got. Um, and it also removed the sky glow. And this, uh, this image picked up the, the supernova that was just discovered the week before, which is, I believe this star, but I think it may also be this one. It was a bright star that appeared. Um, so that's uh, an example of how you get the pinwheel galaxy. And you can do further work on that. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, nice expensive CCD cameras have a, a de-bloating feature, uh, but I don't have one of those. Uh, so I have a, a cheap CCD camera. So you can see that the stars in my image are kind of fat. And that is because of the longer the exposure you do, the stars will swell up and it's unesthetic. Uh, so uh, uh, you can fix that luckily with, with uh, software. So I just wrote a little uh, routine to de-bloat the stars. And this uses some additional image processing uh, functionality built into Mathematica. So what it's doing here it um, it makes a mask by thresholding the image. So this picks out just the brightest elements of the image. And it inflates the stars by a little bit to make a, a paint mask. So this is uh, an image which just has like slightly fatter versions of the stars on it. And then it calls our in-paint routine, which with the image and the paint mask, and this um, will fill in everywhere in the target image with its surrounding pixels. So it basically erases all the stars from the image. Um, then we can sharpen up the background. And uh, then we take our, our stars in the, um, um, in our uh, mask here, and we will shrink them by uh, doing erosion on it. Uh, with a disk matrix, uh, which uh, does an erosion, uh, a uniform circular erosion, and it shrinks them down and gives them a little bit of a blur so that edge artifacts aren't visible and it adds that back in. And there's still a few little uh, creaky pieces here, but it, the stars look sharper. And this is closer to um, what you'd see in a better picture of the galaxy. So that is about it. There's uh, references here, links to um, the um, posting I did um, a couple months ago about uh, manually aligning James Webb Space Telescope images. And um, the other posting I did, which describes this with an additional example of another galaxy um, as well. So, that's it. And if um, if everyone has any questions, this is a good time to ask them. Okay, a couple questions here. Uh, I, di I didn't see these. Uh, have you ever tried to do stacking uh, out of a video instead of single photos? Uh, yes, I have. And this works best for planetary uh, photography. Uh, uh, and I've, I've done some examples of that in uh, previous um, 
lectures, but that, that works uh, better for uh, like planetary photography. You have a video and you take that of uh, like Mars or Jupiter. And uh, by combining thousands of images, you can get a fairly sharp image, but you know, it doesn't, um, it doesn't work miracles. Uh, you, you have to have a fairly steady image to begin with. Uh, and then, and then it will, uh, it will clean itself up. Um, how long does it take to process one image using the image pipeline? Well, I just processed it. Uh, so it, it took about um, uh, 30 seconds for, uh, for um, uh, 20 uh, subframes. Um, they're, they're not super high resolution subframes, I might add. Uh, you can get cameras which are much higher resolution and those would take longer, of course. Uh, did you say what camera you have? Yes, I have the cheapest uh, possible um, uh, CCD camera. It's a uh, an Orion um, Starshoot G4. Uh, it's the cheapest monochrome camera with a filter wheel on it, um, and it um, uh, it's not a thousands of dollars uh, CCD camera, but it does okay for for what I like to do. And as and since the images are not super high resolution, they're pretty easy to uh, uh, to work with, and it also gives me uh, good opportunities to improve things using Mathematica code. And Jeff uh, said, "Do you have any new targets planned from uh, your darker house?" Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to be relocating to a darker sky site with lots more view of the uh, of uh, the sky instead of that narrow slot that I've got right now in my present place in Urbana. So uh, yes, I, I'm going to probably take some pictures of the Eagle Nebula and a few other uh, southern sky objects uh, instead of the few that you keep seeing during these lectures, which are the ones that pass right over my house. Um, so yeah, I've got I've got a lot of plans for that and uh, and new projects and all sorts of things that I'm I'm working on um, in my copious free time. Uh, let's see, any other questions? Let's see. Yeah, next time um, Mars comes around, uh, I'll probably be taking some uh, some of this uh, video of uh, of mars last time i took a lot of pictures of mars and i managed to get a kind of a fuzzy picture of it which is a lot better than the thing that i was looking at through my telescope which was like something that was bouncing around like that but it was uh but i think i can probably do better than that uh so i'm i've got some plans and and maybe uh uh a better camera a better camera that i'm working on i i i, I tend to build my equipment so I it's uh I'm I'm super cheap when it comes to this stuff so that's why I tend to uh, uh, build stuff rather than buy stuff okay I think we are just about done. So I am going to uh, leave here in a minute. If there's any uh, further questions, uh, please ask them now. I will be uploading this uh, notebook and the data uh, so you can access it uh, soon. And uh, then uh, you can play around with this code and hopefully improve on what I have done. But other than that, I will be saying goodbye and have fun uh, with your own astrophotography adventures.